All right. Hey, everybody. We are here today with someone very special. Uh, his name is Ramon Delgado. Uh, he's a shamanic practitioner and healer, um, and he's taught me many things throughout my own uh, journey, I suppose. Uh, so here he is. Ramon, feel free to introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us a little more about you. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Ramon Delgado. I am a shamanic practitioner and a shamanic healer. Um, my main helper that I work with is Santa. Uh, the vast uh, a majority of my practice as a shamanic killer and a shamanic practitioner, professionally speaking and, and privately as well, revolves around the energy of ancestral healing and unraveling generational curses, which is the main uh, topic that I would like to discuss with you here today. Shamanism, uh, there are two main uh, aspects of shamanism in the modern world, okay? There is modern day contemporary cross-cultural shamanism that anybody can practice. And there is cultural shamanism that are close practices to individual cultures that should not be culturally appropriate. Shamanism on its own is cross-cultural because it is the original form of human spirituality. It is what every single religion and spiritual practice evolved from. The shaman is someone who, in an ecstatic state of trance, exits their body and enters what the great late anthropologist Dr. Mark Harner used to call non-ordinary reality, into non-ordinary reality, or what normal people would usually call the spirit world, but it's not quite the same, you know. It's similar in a shamanic state of consciousness, in a trance, but the energy is different. What we go into, we go into a other world into a spiritual plane of existence. And we commune with the spirits that live there. And we bring back healing, we bring back knowledge, we bring back wisdom, we bring back divinity. It is a very specific aspect of healing. Uh, and it contains its own ethic, morals, its own cosmology, its own theology. It's actually, very much something that we uh, we really uh, need to understand before understanding uh, uh, ancestral healing, because the ancestors are part of that cosmology. Mm -hmm. You know, um, looking deeper into this, the difference between cross-cultural shamanism and cultural shamanism is, is that cult, uh, uh, indigenous shamans have practices that are specific to their culture. You know, the the, the, the sweat lodges of the Plains Indians in the United States, the ayahuasca shamans of the of the Amazon basin, the 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 mess uh, the despacho ceremonies of the Quechua shamans of uh, of Peru and and South America, all of these energies are specific to those cultures, and unless you have been invited into those particular types of uh, cultures and have been taught by indigenous shamans, trying to practice them and just grab have them out of the internet or out of a book and saying, I am a shaman now is blatant cultural appropriation. Yeah. What I practice is something called core shamanism. And in core shamanism was created by Dr. Michael Harner, may he rest in peace. And what he did is that he got together a group of anthropologists and they went all over the world and they studied and cataloged the uh, practices of indigenous, indigenous shamans everywhere. And then they came back together and they compare notes and they say, this is what is cross-cultural, what they all have in common, that it is not traditional or in, uh, to their indigenous practices. This is cross-cultural. And that is what became core shamanism. That's what I practice. Nice. That's a very good uh, breakdown of that. Um, awesome. And we, so we talked about cultural appropriation and everything. Um, so how did you get into doing some of this stuff? Before? You know, it's really interesting for how I got into shamanism because my call to shamanism, it's actually very much the calling of a traditional indigenous shaman. Mm -hmm. I just do not have the training of traditional indigenous shaman. Uh, when I was really young, um, I, when I, I was born in San Jose, California. And when I was a tiny little baby, my mother baby napped me, uh, lived with her and her family in the West Coast of Mexico. And as a small child, I got incredibly sick with an upper respiratory issue. My aunts and my uncles in Mexico were very wealthy. So they took me to see the best doctors that money could buy. And no doctor could actually diagnose something that I had. They all disagreed with each other. 
They all knew that I was on my way to the grave, but there was nothing they could do for me because they had no idea what was wrong with me. Then one day uh, when I was really sick, there was a huge storm, a ginormous storm and no ambulance could come get me when I had this ginormous fever that was cooking me from the inside out. And they could not go in a car and take me to the hospital or to the doctor either because of the storm. Oof. Down trees and phone lines and torrential downpours and all of that. So what happens is that I remember exiting my body and above me a huge bright light. And in that bright light was the saint, the helper spirit that um, normally watches over my family, the main spirit that my, that my family prayed to. And behind me, below me was the darkness of the grave. And this bird went, okay, you have two choices, little kid. I was four years old at the time. And it says, you can either work for me for the rest of your life, or you can go join the ancestors right now. Wow. And that was my beginning. Uh, my grandmother, after that, uh, after that day, actually, I say I was never sick again from the same illness. Uh, my grandmother, for the next few years, became my, my first teacher in healing work. And, and curanderismo, which is a Mexican folk in, in Mexico, and in brujería as well, which is sorcery, because she practiced both. Uh, my family practiced both. Uh, and that's how I got started. I mean, after my grandmother died, my life was no longer safe. There was nobody protecting me from the dangers of the world. So I stopped. As an adult, when I entered the military, I got really sick again. And nobody understood why I was sick again. And it was, again, something called what well, that in shamanism we call shamanic illness, which is an initiatory illness that is meant to uh, continue until you are set in your path as a shaman or as a healer. Mm -hmm. And what it was is, is that my bones were losing density. And when I was diagnosed, I was told that I would be in a wheelchair within two years. Oh, wow. And after I left the military on a medical because of that illness, I started studying many different forms of spiritual healing from around the world. I studied Reiki, which you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. I went to massage therapy school. Um, I studied aromatherapy, crystal healing, and that eventually led me back to shamanism. And it was not until I started studying shamanism that a lot of the illnesses that plagued my life, you know, the, the bone density issues, my mental health care issues, because I had a mental breakdown in the military, you know, my, my mental health care issues, my people. PTSD, my, um, my, my, my uh, epilepsy, all of that, you know, what did not go away completely became manageable through medication and, and, medi and, and, and healthcare. So for me, it was not until I came to shamanism that this initiatory illnesses went away. And that is the benchmark of a traditional shaman. You know, it's just that when the initiatory illnesses come, it is not until we step into the path that we're meant to walk that the illnesses go away. And I need to make sure very understood to your viewers that initiatory illnesses are not necessarily always shamanic in nature. They're illnesses that can put you in a different path, you know, that can take you to Reiki, to Santa Muerte work, to, to paganism, to Wicca, to, 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 to Christianity, to, to laying on all the hands as a preacher or a, or, a, or, or, or a priest or a pastor. You know, initiatory illness is basically what calls you to the path. And that's how I got started. Hmm. Um, my, my beginning was in a workshop with the Foundation of Shamanic Studies, shamanism, uh, the main way in which I did that. By the way, my internet connection is not very good. So if I cut out, uh, uh, it's just that I will come back as soon as I will, uh, as soon as I correct that. Okay. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I've just been as quiet as I can because I also didn't want to contribute to that. So uh, I don't think we've missed anything. It just has come out a little bit and then come back in. So it's all good. I find that interesting when you were talking about um, the initiatory path and such, um, because as you were saying, a lot of people who work with Santa Muerte find themselves in a similar um, although it's different. I know, I know, I understand being a healer and having known you for forever. Like, <laughs> I, I understand the, the different um, initiatory path that you're talking about with the illness. Um, but a lot of times you'll find something similar with people who work with Santa Muerte. Be it, it's usually, not always, but I find it's usually a little more social. 
um, versus the physical illness or, or mental illness could fall under either, I suppose. But I'm, I don't know, I'm curious kind of about like some of your experience with um, these initiatory paths and also how you find them with Santa Muerte and how they sort of like overlap, because they do overlap a little bit. Well, you know, initiatory illness doesn't have to be physical. There's mental illness that can be an initiatory path, particularly mental breakdowns and psychotic breaks, like schizophrenic uh, episodes, uh, but also uh, soul loss. Mm -hmm. Susto, you know, we, we did a video on Susto on your, on your YouTube channel before. So Susto on soul loss is, could be an initiatory illness. Um, and that's something that goes into the energy as well of post-traumatic stress disorder. Because post-traumatic stress disorder, shamanically speaking, is very much linked with soul loss, with susto. And for those of you not familiar with susto or soul loss, as it states, um, it, it's the energy when something so traumatic happens to us that a little piece of our soul or a large piece or fragment, and they go into neuronal reality to, to a safe place where they cannot be in the state of trauma. In the cases where it's connected to post-traumatic stress disorder, it's because those, those, um, those pieces of our soul are stuck in time and space in, in ordinary reality, reliving their trauma over and over and over again in a loop. And because of that, they cannot move beyond it. And for many people, mental illness, spiritual illness, shamanic illness are all combined. And when you get to the point of soul loss, power loss, you know, losing your power animal or your totem or whatever you call it, uh, all of these energies have a deep impact on your physical life. You know, if you don't have a healthy heart energy because there's a missing piece in your energy system around your heart area, you're not going to be able to make that heart to heart connection that is required for a healthy relationship. Mm. If you have a huge missing area in around your root, around your sexual organs, okay, you're not going to be able to enjoy your sensuality to the fullest. Mm -hmm. If you had a huge missing point around your throat, you're not going to be able to speak your truth or communicate with care and well-being. And all of these energies are forms of initiatory illnesses because when we get those pieces back, and we are once again healthy and empowered, we can step into life in order to live their life's purpose far better than before. And a lot of the times that begins when we the spirits that are met of us in our path, as either as healers, as brujos or brujeros or granderas or witches or whatever you want to call yourself. When that spirit steps forward and says, I'm going to help you get better, and in exchange, you're going to do work for me and be with me, be, be my human, my living human, that, that energy is by all means initiatory. For me, it happened with Santa Muerte. In, in my first class with the foundation, we did a shamanic journey uh, to meet uh, uh, our main teacher spirit. And I was uh, expecting a completely different spirit that my grandmother introduced me to. And much to my surprise, there was Santa Muerte. <laughs> And that's how I got started working with Santa Muerte. She just showed up and goes, no, I'm going to teach you how to be a healer. Nice. Yeah, and, and that's very common. And um, I wish I can go back to what you were saying a minute ago. There was something that you were saying uh, about with the soul loss and everything. Um, and it's just, it's just, it's a very common thing that I've seen with a lot of practitioners. Um, when you're able to reclaim that type of an underworld journey, it's a type of transformation, essentially. Um, and so it is truly one of the specialties of Santa Muerte as well, because of that. <laughs> the uh, reclamation of the power, of your own power, your own personal power, through that transformative journey. Well, part of that is also the energy of being willing to embrace the wound to say, I understand that I am wounded, you know, which to many people can feel incredibly disempowering, but it's like having your right arm chopped off. You know, you chopped off your right arm until you pick it up off the ground and take it to the hospital to get reattached. You're going to be bleeding out and you're going to have a missing arm, you know? And as disempowering, it's terrifying as it may feel to look at your arm on the floor and your bleeding stump of your arm, 
you know, you're not going to be able to get the healing that you need. And that is part of the initiatory illness. You know, it's that energy of embracing the fact that there's something that you need to transcend. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, I think that would describe kind of in a way, one of the paths of this ancestral healing in a sense, especially if that wound was something that was, and a lot of them are, um, if, if not the roots are in childhood and also passed down, um, or the, the roots of whatever trauma that eventually happened were already there, usually, not always. Well, yeah, that's, that's what generational healing and ancestral healing is, you know? It is healing the, the patterns that get passed on from generation to generation to generation, not only only in family lines, but in communities. Because there have been situations that I've seen as a healer the last few years since I've been doing my practice of ancestral healing, that it encompasses people who are friends of the family, you know, or community members, you know. I have seen um, situations in which uh, the, well, the, the, the beginning of the curse was not within family. The beginning of the pattern was not within family, but someone who was a friend of the family who affected my client's family line. And because of that, there was a greater just stopped. So, and I will talk more in depth about that, you know, about ancestral healing, but that is the energy uh, within, particularly within curanderismo, we call them uh, ancestral curses, generational curses, you know, that part of ancestral healing. And there's a huge difference that I got to make People, you know, people ask, you know, what are uh, and what is general ancestral healing? What are generational curses? Um, there is a necessity to understand first who the ancestors are. You know, the ancestors are those who lived well and died well. Those who are at peace, those who have over into the afterlife and have lessons. This other energies that I deal with my ancestral healing practice and unraveling generational curses are those who did not live well and did not die well and who are stuck in what in shamanic uh, states of consciousness and in core shamanism we call the middle world you know the cosmology and shamanism is divided into three sections the lower world beneath us the middle world is this world that we live in however it is so in um in the energy of non-ordinary reality. There is this world, the physical world, and this world, the spiritual world. And then above us, there is the upper world. And each of those, of those upper, above and below us have many layers. And it's normally uh, taught in the allegory of a tree. You wanna go to the lower world, you go down the roots of the tree. You wanna go to the upper world, you travel the, the branches of the tree, and you keep going up or down the layers that you need to do your healing. And when it happens in the energy of generational, uh, issues on ancestral healing is, is that we get a lot of energy that we deal with in the middle world, in this world, in spirit, because we have spirits who, looking deeper into this, when they passed away, they did not cross over. I don't know if you ever live in a house with several roommates and one roommate gets a cold. Mm -hmm. That's the way I explain it to my clients. You know, then the next person gets to call and the next person gets to call and people keep better and getting better and then getting sick until everybody gets sick at the same time and then everybody gets better at the same time. Well, the issue with that uh, allegory, with that metaphor for uh, shamanic healing and ancestral healing is, is that the people who originally has the cold is already dead <laughs> and they cannot be quarantined and they cannot be taken away because that's what they're doing. They're passing along their issues to the world of the living. Mm -hmm. And that is the core of ancestral healing. It is dealing with the energy of the ancestor, of, of those who should be ancestors, but can't because they're stuck in the middle world, living in their issues and need to get help from the living and instead passing on their issues onto the living. And so it's almost like it amplifies it then. And so it just keeps amplifying this until someone eventually has to change it, has to, or it dies out. Well, see, the thing when it gets to the point of a generational, uh, an, an, a, a generation, a generational curse, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is, it's an, an amplification of an ancestral healing. Mm -hmm. Ancestral patterns can be broken. You can make the effort and say, this is as far as it goes, you yeah. know? I am not going to continue to enable this energy in my life if it's only a pattern. Mm -hmm. 
when you have the spirits of the dead involved, that's a whole other level, mm -hmm. you know, a whole other level of negativity. Um, and that is when we get to the level of generational curses. Would you say that's where it becomes a systemic thing in the family unit as a whole, woven into this? It is definitely a systemic point when you get to the level of a generational curse. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna give an example of the perfect example of a generational curse. And that happened to me during the metaphysical market. If you remember the metaphysical market. Absolutely. You know, you and I used to put up a um, psychic fair at the Seattle underground called the metaphysical market. Yes. And this was right around 2014, like one of the first ones that we did. Wow, okay. And I had a client who came in to a bone, and I did a bone reading, I'll throw the bone, I cast the bones, which is a form of shamanic divination. And in this reading, my client came up with the energy that every single man in her family for the past 12 generations had died of the exact same illness at the exact same age. Mm -hmm. As soon as they, some of them in their birthday, when they hit that age, that illness took them. 12 generations going back. Mm -hmm. That is the epitome of a generational curse. And for me, that's how I got started with this path because she asked me, how do I fix this? And as a shamanic killer, I went, well, crap, I have to be, I have to be truthful. I have to be honest and ethical and say, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Here is the web address for uh, the Foundation for Shamanic Studies. They have fans healers there. Maybe someone can help you because I don't know what, what I'm doing here with this on a journey and I went to one of my teacher's spirits and I went, uh, how do I fix that? <laughs> and over the next year or two, little by little, I was given uh, the steps that became the practice that is my energy of unraveling generational curses, which includes a great deal of psychopomp work, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. crossing over the spirits of those uh, deceased loved ones who are perpetuating their patterns on the world of the living. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen a lot of that with just Santa Muerte in the graveyard. A lot of, um, there's a lot of graveyard workings that you can do like with your own shadow, which are pretty neat. Um, or with your own ancestral line that I've kind of been shown. And it's similar, it's, it's being able to take them to the graveyard and put them to rest, literally. Uh, literally like a crossing over of them or of them maybe personified, kind of like we would personify different aspects of the self. Um, but this is different aspects of like your family line, um, which is more like a con constellation, you could call it, because they do type, this type of work in constellation therapies too kind of, um, although it doesn't retroactively do anything. Uh, it only works if the other person, it, it, it might if they're deceased, I suppose, a little bit better than if they're living. Otherwise you need the other person in order to really make it work. But um, there's a lot of really cool things that you can do uh, with the workings of the graveyard specifically that psychology hasn't caught up with yet, which is kind of exciting. Well, you know, one thing to talk about when it comes to all of this, Mm. that I've seen is, is that in my practice of ancestral healing, and I can go in greater depth about what it contains, you know, what, what the sure. steps are, if, if you need, if you That's want great. me to. But I have seen how doing the steps that my helper spirits, my teacher spirits have taught me, uh, set off uh, a wave. It's like you have a koi pond, you know, about the size of your extended arms, and you throw a, a giant rock about half of its size and there's this that floats to the tallest waves and that is the energy of shamanic healing shamanic killing echoes throughout time and space and touches everyone involved i have had clients whose entire family dynamics has changed i have clients who come to me and their family who had a uh, history of chemical dependency was starting to get help you know, one of my clients told me, you know, my drug of choice no longer appeals to me. Wow, nice. And my the other clients say, you know, my brother's getting help for that issue or this issue. So there is there is a great deal uh, when we're dealing with generational curses in particular. Uh, what happens when you release a generational curse in spirit? Mm -hmm. um, it comes to surface for everyone to either deal with it or be destroyed by it. 
And I tell my clients who are the genetic bearers of the lineage, who are releasing the generational curse on behalf of their family, that they cannot take responsibility about how their loved ones uh, ex, uh, accept that energy, you know, how they deal with that generational curse when they come to surface. Because once we cross over the spirits of the dead, there is no longer an excuse of, well, this is the way it got passed down to me, or this is the way the dead have been perpetuating this on me, or this is the way it's always been. At that moment, there is no longer the excuse of the generational curse after the healing session, that the excuse is simply a cop out of you not wanting to deal with your version of the pattern of change what you have inside of you. And I have had people who self-destructed and I have had people whose lives got better and it is really up to them. And in that aspect, if my clients take responsibility for let's say their brother who's very self-destructive, they're going to create a new version of an enmeshed family dynamic right. that will eventually create a new generational curse of its own. Right. Or evolve one that's already there. I've seen that as well. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, with a lot of people that work with that sort of enmeshment, um, I did a sort of more psychological approach to generational curses recently. Um, and just kind of talking about ev how everyone plays a role in it. Um, and it, it, it can be difficult because sometimes even if you deny your role, the only thing you have left to do is walk away depending on what your role is. So um, sometimes it, it depends on how things are working and if people are going to be willing to see it or not, but um, even just one person just denying their role uh, is still something that will bring everything up to surface for everyone else because the roles will have changed at least somewhat. Yes. Well, one of the things that I do in my in my practice of uh, unraveling generational curses is also unweaving the web of life. Mm -hmm. Working with the spirits that weave the web of life and ask them, please unweave this, this pattern of toxicity in this family and this community. And when we're done, please reweave a healthy pattern for them. And I've actually seen that as well um, in like the MP type of community um, and like, like neuro-linguistic programming type of things. Um, and also with people that do like certain types of psychology, um, there's also a way to like rewrite some of your memories um, where you, you perp it's kind of like if you were to rewrite a dream, you have a dream, you don't like it, you're wanting to fall back asleep and you rewrite the dream so it's got a better ending or an ending that's funny or, or an ending that's whatever. So it's not disempowering um, and, or, or scary or whatever. And then you can fall back asleep. Similarly, you can do that to an extent. Um, I, I call it making your own mythology, I suppose. Um, but to an extent, you're able to rewrite your own mythology in there. What is it that you'd rather it be? Uh, and I mean, depend. It, you can't. Sometimes you can get kind of crazy with it because it's fun, and other times your brain just won't let you. But um, even just rewriting it a little bit can change the dynamic enough that it doesn't sting the same way, that you can see things from a certain perspective and it doesn't hurt anymore. Uh, and then you can actually start doing more of the work of healing. That uh, is another one of the ways I've seen as, as well. Well, then there's a certain step on releasing generational curses that I do, that my helper spirits, my teacher spirit taught me, that I haven't seen any other shamanic practitioner do. And there's a few of us doing this work around the country in our own way. Nice. You, you know, through, through the pagan community, you came across Orion Foxwood in the past, who mm -hmm. does this amazing work and meditation and trance work with the river of blood. Yes. Um, but I do my own version of this. And part of my own series of steps that I do in this that I've never seen anyone else do is actually transmuting the energy of the curse itself. Nice. Because when it comes to curses, whether they are booga, 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 you're a toad curse, <laughs> or, you know, where there is a pattern that has been ingrained in family dynamics, mm. or whether it is your own toxicity that you are refusing to release, the longer it is enabled, the longer it becomes strong and stronger and stronger until eventually it takes on a life of its own, mm -hmm. you know? And much like that cold being a virus, this uh, this golem, this amalgamation, this thought form that is a generational curse carries a huge amount of weight 
on the perpetuation of generational curses on family dynamics. So as a skilled healer or priest or priestess or witch or whatever you call yourself, if you take care of the bonds that have been connected to each other in an unhealthy way, that's wonderful. If you cross over the spirits of the dead, which I'm gonna talk about, about a little bit more here in a second, that's even better. But if you refuse to heal the energy of the virus, the thought form that is the generational curse, this is just going to manifest again several generational generations down at a later point when the entity is strong enough to do it again. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. So what? Uh, that's that's the full method then. That, that's what you do for the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, one thing that I do a lot, you know, it, it, another thing that I do is cross over the spirits of the dead. But one thing that most people don't realize. Oh my God, this is something that most people are not aware of, and that's soul theft. Mm -hmm. There are situations where uh, people can take pieces of your take control over you. Okay, every single curse that is cast involves a form of soul theft. Okay, um, a best example of this is Haitian voodoo. Okay, in Haitian voodoo, when Abokor uh, creates a zombie, he steals a very specific type of soul piece, a very specific piece of the cosmological soul of Haitian people. And that's how they uh, control them because they control that piece of their soul. Hmm. In generational curses, I have lost count how many times I've thrown the bones and say, you know, this goes seven, eight, nine generations before. And when I do my shamanic journey to cross over the dead, I find the entire family, eight, nine, ten generations together in ordinary reality, together there being controlled by the individual who started the, uh, the pattern and saying, you know, they are mine. You know, that, 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 that energy of, of toxicity that you described that gets passed down the, 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 cons the, cons the constellations of family dynamics that you spoke of. Uh, the dead, just because they die doesn't mean that, that they're saints now. You know, some of them are just as toxic in death as they were in life. And I have seen so many of them keep grasp of the people that they had hurt after they died, but also their future generations. And that's a huge reason why they are so hard to release the generational curse, because it has a hold of not only the previous generations, but each generation that passes away, they get stronger and stronger by keeping control of them. And part of healing a generational curse is passing, uh, helping cross over, not just the energy of the original uh, perpetu uh, per uh, per uh, perpetuator of, of the curse, you know, the first person who brought it to be, but also all of the future generations who are stuck in not ordinary reality in the middle world, unable to cross over, either because they are being controlled by the, the toxic uh, abuser or whatever it was, or because they themselves are still hurting because of what happened to them with this generational pattern, this curse. Mm. So that's a huge part of what I do as well. You know, so that is the beginning. First, I I unravel the 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 the, the web of life and we weave it. Then I cross over the dead, including the future, all of these gestalt of dead people into the afterlife. And after that, I release the generational curse. You know, I, I, I transmute the thought form that is a generational curse. And that is the first half of my, of my, of my pattern. And after that, I, I have to stay in a shamanic state of consciousness in a partial trance while I'm doing all of this, because this is very intense healing, you know, yeah. very, very intense. I have had clients who needed to take breaks. I have clients who just broke down bawling. It's particularly when I'm doing the soccer pump work. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of my clients, uh, even the ones that are not sensitive to spiritual energy, says, oh my God, I felt them leave. Mm -hmm. All of them. You know, I have clients who were not sensitive to spiritual energy at all who said, I used to feel this grasp on my arm like somebody was grabbing me all the time. And now it's wow. gone. So I have to take a breather between each of these sections and go, you know, do you feel the difference? Mm. Do you acknowledge the difference? 
-hmm. Are you going to do whatever you need to do to make sure you don't go back to the way it used to be? That's something I have them verbally state to themselves in their own words, you know, say it to yourself out loud, make that statement, make that promise. That's that shadow work. It is heavy shadow work. Mm -hmm. Because we're not only dealing with your, our own shadows, we're dealing with the shadows of our ancestors. Any expectations? We are going, we are going up to them and, and helping them gain resolution on their lives. Because a lot of the times, with the reasons they don't cross over, it's because of their own shadow work. Mm-hmm. And I, as a shamanic killer, have to go to them. And when they don't want to cross over, I have to figure out why. Mm -hmm. I cannot just drag them and throw them into the afterlife. That's just not ethical. So I have to go to them and help them gain closure in their toxicity, be willing to release their toxicity and be willing to accept the healing. And sometimes that takes several sessions. I have clients who I don't four, five, six, seven sessions with that were dismantling generational curses piece by piece, which leads me leads me to the next step, which is either power animal retrieval or soul retrieval. Mm. And I, just to go back for a second, I would imagine that each person that you're crossing over has a direct connection to an aspect, probably subconscious, probably shadow aspect of that client that they have to address. Some little voice that's programmed in their head to say, it was actually great grandfather or whatever. Um, and so when you're crossing these spirits over, then they have to do all this shadow work that connects to each spirit that you're crossing over. And that does unravel it, but that's a lot. That is a lot of work. Well, you know, and that's, that's when I call in Santa Muerte. Mm-hmm. After I cross them over and I take them to whatever version of the afterlife where they need to be, I say, Santa Muerte, please cut the bonds that connect them to the world of the living. So the people who run this plane of existence can help them heal and be in a better place. Uh, normally, uh, I would help them myself individually go through the shadow work with them in our ordinary reality, but I don't have that kind of time in a professional setting. <laughs> right. you know, that would take two, three, four, five hours for a single session or a single healing. And most of my clients don't have that type of endurance, nor the money to compensate me for the time that I would be spending doing all of that. Right. Yes, by the time people get to me for a shamanic killing, their head is quite metaphorically on fire and they need me to put it out. And most of them have had to save for months to get to, to pay my, my little bit. And my fees are quite affordable, mind you, but they still have to save yeah, they because are. this shamanic illness has permeated their entire lives and they can no longer uh, do this work uh, on own and they did and their whole lives are a mess so yeah nice. what i do is that i cross them over where they belong and i say santa muerte from here on it's between you between divinity and them please release the bonds that connect them to the world of the living mm-hmm. that's nice and then and then you were going on into the next part which i interrupted just a little bit yeah which (laughs) there's one out of one of two aspects of this the first one would be if the person uh feels that they have had enough Mm -hmm. that going into a full-blown soul retrieval because you yourself i work soul retrieval with you and you know how intense it is yes you know and i explain that to them in great detail and i will go on about this here in a second sometimes it's worth it but it's intense yes Sometimes, you know, I go to my power animals or to my helper spirits or my teacher spirits at the beginning of the session going, my client has this issue. How do I fix it? You know, because I don't just go, yeah, sure, let's do uh, uh, ancestral healing. No, I actually, at the beginning of the session, after the bone throw, I go to my helper spirits and go, what do I do about what the bone throw say? You know, mm-hmm. what is the, 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 the prescription for today? And if we're doing ancestral healing, sometimes they tell me, don't do the soul retrieval just do a power animal retrieval because because of this series of traumas you know this series of illnesses that they've been living with their entire life they have felt powerless Mm -hmm. to change their life for the better and that's the key word when you need a power animal retrieval you do feel absolutely powerless in your life for the better 
Now, power animals are the amalgamations, the, the living, breathing spirits in non ordinary reality, who are the personification of all of our good traits, our happiness, our joy, our wisdom, our strength, our power, our, our, our voice, everything that is good about us. So when something bad happens and they go run away screaming because they got hurt trying to protect you, you end up getting feeling very powerless. And I had situations in which we get to the point of that we have released the golem, you know, we have unwoven the web, we have crossed over the dead, we have uh, released the thought form or golem as I call them. And then we get to this part and I go, okay, do you want to go for the soul retrieval or do you want to just do the power animal retrieval like I was guided to do? I always leave them as a choice. And most of the times they go, well, let's begin with the power animal retrieval. Let's see how I feel. Nice. And that's when I do the power animal retrieval, that's when I take, again, break after each chunk, you know, saying, you know, do you feel the difference between how you felt before? How do you feel now? Mm -hmm. And I also noticed when we went through, I think I've done all of this stuff with you over the years. Um, when we went through any of these things, sometimes you don't feel a thing right away. Yeah. But I knew something had happened because like I'm an energy worker too. So like, I'm like, I know something happened, but I don't feel any different. And then it sometimes takes weeks or months. And then suddenly you're like, Ooh, and I called you up and I'm like, Oh yeah. So by the way, that, that uh, soul, uh, soul retrieval, Mm, I'm feeling it now. And this was like two or three months later. So like, that's also pretty common, I think. Yep, it is. <laughs> I'm like, I don't common. think it's just me, but like. <laughs> no, actually, most people don't feel that thing in shamanic healing during the healing, unless you're very psychic, very sensitive. Mm -hmm. It is after the, the healing, you know, when it gets intense. And that's what I took people about soul retrieval when we get to the last part. Because what happens is, is that a lot of the times, uh, remember how I talked about soul theft? Mm -hmm. Well, every single person involved in the generational curse in the family uh, constellation has suffered soul theft mm -hmm. from the, the uh, person who began the cycle of abuse. That is how the soul uh, energy is being infected with the generational curse. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I have to do a soul retrieval, not only to bring back the soul pieces that have been lost to the trauma, but the soul pieces that have been stolen mm. to say, you're going to live that type of life that I want you to live that is toxic. You don't get to be happy because I'm not happy. Right. And because of that, I got to tell my clients, you know, the part of you, particularly, I have a lot of female clients who come to me who uh, come from abusive relationships. And I get to tell them, you know, the part of you that is a strong, contemporary, feminist, badass woman, I am woman, hear me roar type of energy, that's you. You're the one who made it out of your trauma. Mm -hmm. Those tiny little pieces of you who fragmented along the way, they were not that strong. They were not that powerful. They were like little kids who got beaten up all the time, who tried to run away to their happy place. And some of them are still with their abusers and they're gonna need a good mama and a good daddy and a good family and a mental health care practitioner to nurse them back to health. A lot are of you passion. To, yeah. Are you up to that challenge? Are you passion. willing to do that? Yeah. Are you willing to do that for yourself and to have your community behind you and your professionals to help you behind you? Because as much as I love to support you on a spiritual level, I cannot help you on a psychological level because I don't have the training of a mental health practitioner. I'm not qualified. Right. And I have to give them that, that, that ability to lay down that boundary and said, either yes, I am ready or no, let's just do the power animal retrieval, which is basically the bandage on the wound. And I could come back to you when I'm ready for the soul retrieval. Mm, right. Yeah, because I mean, you do have to be willing when those pieces come back to be that parent, to be that whatever uh, that they didn't have, uh, but, but that's you. So that you didn't have, you have to be that for you. And I've done a lot of like retroactive healing, 
by being able to do this. Like it, it's, it's like it echoes back through my generations, my own personal decades maybe, um, to heal this thing, this thing all the way rooted back there. And I can almost trace it energetically and I can feel it heal. Um, and it's, that's, I guess that, that's how I've seen healing these things in the past. Doing it now heals it in the past, in the future, in the present, all of the above. Yeah. And it's similar in how that works with like the, the ancestors as well and, and the, the future uh, generations of your own lineage too with the ancestral healing. So, but it, it's hard. It's a lot of shadow work. It really is. It's taking responsibility for things that aren't really supposed to ever have been your responsibility. Uh, one of my clients uh, who I did this work with called it, called it a marathon of healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it really is a one hour session is a marathon of healing. And I tell all my clients who are thinking about doing this, this series of workings with me that they're going to feel like they got microwaved by the end of the session if they're sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the changes, sometimes you can even feel that they're going to happen. You don't know what they're going to be, but it's like, oh, get ready. You got about a week. <laughs> like, there it comes. And I don't know, I've, I've, I've sensed that with certain activating, activations, activate, activated healings maybe, which is kind of what this is. It's like, it is a type of initiation almost that you do. It's a healing initiation. Um, which again is why we had to talk about shamanism first. <laughs> yeah, because it, you know, ancestral healing can definitely be an initiatory practice, you know, initiatory illness. Um, there's one last part to this healing that I'm just beginning to do, mm. and that is helping with the energy of the dead in the afterlife who are refused to let go of the generational curse. And I do that with Santa Muerte. You know, Santa Muerte taught me to take that energy of them who are basically refusing to stop being toxic mm -hmm. and take their energy and give it to Santa Muerte to intubate in her womb as the, as the, as the mother of the underworld, as, or as, as, as Miklan Siwatl, you know, the, the lady, of, the, the, the lady of, the, of Miklan, and have them be reborn through Santa Muerte and basically wipe the slate clean, you know? Mm -hmm. You no longer get to be toxic. You no longer get to be nasty and evil to everyone because you're not you anymore. You are a brand new human being birthed by Santa Muerte. That's really cool. Yeah. I've I, only done it a couple of times. That's cool. One, a couple of times with the dead and uh, once with a living human being who had such trauma mm. that they, they could not, um, they could not uh, 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 connect with adult to other types of healing. Wow. I've done something similar recently um, through a personal transformation, but that's really cool uh, to be able to do that with the dead, to be able to, because yeah, some spirits just don't want to accept help. Anything. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it does kind of truly pour into this realm. You can feel it depending on the spirit. So, and yeah, that's much easier that's because other, other people who have um, come into contact with that sort of energy that I've known. Um, I mean, not, not you. Well, not you. <laughs> I'm like, I'm remembering one specific example, I guess, but like, uh, they would often just like pummel it with energy, you know, like, um, to, to try to force, it's like a battle of wills almost. And what you're describing is, uh, just kind of flowing with the water, which is what I've been taught recent, more recently, past couple of years. Um, Santa Muerte's really been teaching how to flow with the water, <laughs> not to go against the water. Uh, so yeah. That's yeah. Really anyway, and, that is my process for healing generational curses. That's wonderful. And, and I have a question about this for you. Um, since you do this pretty regularly uh, now, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it's cool because I've been able to see your process over the years. Um, I remember distinctly some of these things happening and how you've changed um, some of your processes anyway, uh, the past few years. Um, but when talking about the initiatory experience that like a lot of this healing uh, takes you on, um, how much do you think, um, because in my healing work, a lot of times when people come to me uh, with a lot of things, there's either a test involved for me 
or a reinitiation into something or an initiation into something new uh, where I have to dive into the energy to get another lesson on it, let's say at a deeper level. Uh, and I'm assuming since I've, I've seen you do this a lot, that's kind of how this developed for you, I believe. Um, it was just diving deeper and deeper into initiatory experiences, but how has that been for you? Because I mean, I haven't like asked you that question for probably at least four years. Uh, so I'm curious, how's that evolving for you? The more that you do some of this, the deeper, um, the, the, the personal path of initiation with being an ancestral healer, let's say. Well, you know, for me, the ancestral healing path is something that I feel very well cemented on, very grounded with. Hmm. It is the energy of dealing with people, uh, beings that are no longer incarnate, that discarnate, that I'm working with more. You know, it began with the rebirth thing through Santa Muerte. And now is starting to move through the energy of what in curanderismo we would say would be dealing with sorcerers and immoral spirits in core shamanism. Um, you know that I went to Wollstonstein Theological Seminary. I have an associates of Wiccan theology with them. And that's something that Santa Muerte wanted me to do. And I didn't understand why until the last year or so uh, when I was getting deeper into my shamanic healing practice. And I had several situations in which my training within Wicca has helped me in my shamanic path. Because core shamanism is not a complete practice on its own. It is the, the groundwork. It is the foundation. It is what well, kind of foundation for shamanic studies. Right. Because it is the foundational work in which you build your practice on. And at one point, more than one point, I was told at the beginning of the session to, to cast a magic circle the way you do in traditional British traditional Wicca, you know, in, in, in the wise tradition of the ATC. So I cast my magic circle, I call the corners and call upon divinity. And it turns out uh, as we do the divination that this person was one, like the first time it happened, this, this person was coming to me because um, they uh, were in a relationship that was incredibly abusive. Oh. And they needed healing to empower themselves to leave the relationship. Hmm. And as I did the healing, this immoral spirit pretending to be a power animal came to the edge of the magic circle and bared its teeth on me and screamed at me and says, you can't take her from me. She is fucking mine. Wow. And that was the embodiment of her abuse. I have several situations twice now where we had uh, attachments. Mm. You know, we have non-human spirits attached to my clients, and I hate doing work with attachments passionately. I'm not happy about it, but they keep getting dropped in front of me to do so. I'm like, fine, I'll do it. And when I cast the magic circle and I started unraveling the connections between the attachment and the person being, uh, uh, being what is the word, uh, afflicted? they were outside of the magic circle and they started pounding on the circle, screaming. Oh, wow. You can't take them from me. They're mine, they're mine. I'm going to kill you. So for me, it is, has become, it began with dealing with the energy of the golem, the energy of the, of the thought form that is a generational curse because I have begun to encounter situations when the generational curse is not just an actual thought form or a goal and yes, those are present, but there is an actual either human spirit who's so toxic that they have transcended humanity into a deeper level of toxicity, or they are straight out a known human spirit who began part of the pattern mm -hmm. an attachment. That is the deeper aspects of the work. Because there are going to be situations for me in which I go to on to release to uh, what is the word to to um, transmute the energy of the thought form, and I get there, and it's the energy of the thought form is the connection to a deceased spirit who was so toxic that they have lost their humanity, mm. or I go there. And when I'm trying to transmute this energy, it turns out that it was never a thought form to begin with. It was an amoral spirit who had had an agenda 
of toxicity towards that person or that family member. Hmm. So that is the, the evolution that I've been going through. Going through. My, all of my work that I do in, in, in releasing generational curses and ancestral healing begins with Santa Muerte. You know? Santa Muerte is my main helper spirit that helps me do this work. I have other spirits that help me with little pieces, you know, uh, kind of like a, kind of like going shopping, you know, you get your groceries in one store, you get your toilet stuff in another store, you, you get your makeup at a different store, you know. Don't want to treat the helper spirits like their stores, mind you, that is very, uh, <laughs> very disrespectful of me to say it that way, but. <laughs> you know, I think it is the only way to make it easily understood is what came to my mind. And I apologize to my helpers <laughs> for treating them like stores. Oh, that's cute. But, you know, each particular helper spirit that I work with has a specialty. Mm. Nice. My, my work with Santa Muerte is primarily the unraveling of Ebby and the generational curses. Nice. That's really cool. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, it's been an interesting path that I've kind of been down uh, a little bit personally as well, um, even recently, but for the past several years. And uh, it's fun. It's really cool hearing your professional take on that since uh, this is a lot of what you do. And I've personally been able to do a lot of this with you, which is great. So, if, yeah. If any of you want to work with me, I do my in-person work out of a store in University Place, Washington, which is a Tacoma area. It's about 30 minutes south of Seattle. It's called Mystic Sanctuary. I am there on Wednesdays and Fridays. My shamanic healing sessions are $150 and they always last one hour or longer, depending on what you need. Um, the, to make an appointment, you normally call the store at 253-302-3563 and make an appointment with Roman for one hour for a shamanic healing session. Awesome. And there we go. And I, I will personally thank you for everything that you do. He's amazing. Um, he's done like all of the things he's mentioned. I have done this work with him. He's done this work on me. So um, yeah, so I love everything that you do. Thank you so much. And thank you so thank much you. for coming and talking to us about everything. Uh, this is a lot of deep mm -hmm. stuff. We've been talking a lot about shadow work um, on the Patreon page. We've been talking a lot about shadow work on uh, the Facebook page, all sorts of things. I've been diving in a lot deeper with this work with people. Um, and I don't think that's gonna stop. We're in a pretty um, major transformation just globally right now. And so all of this information is coming up uh, in very, almost even mundane ways. Like it's starting to weave its way into the fabric of like what's around us naturally in a more uh, big open way, like like with the movie Encanto, for example, which was talking about all of this. And uh, th there's just all sorts of like, like just around us in general right now, uh, energies with all of this transformation personally, um, generationally, culturally, globally. And I think it's just gonna get crazier and crazier. So if, People have been thinking about doing this type of work. Now's a great time to get started on your shadow work, on looking into ancestral healing or healing of, of different parts of yourself as well. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Roman. It was great having you. Thank you for having me. All right, bye.